This video marks the beginning of Chapter 9, which is all about sequences. And in this video, we're going to take a look at the limit of a sequence. So what exactly is a sequence? Well, mathematically, a sequence is simply a function whose domain is the set of positive integers. So if I have a function like this, f of x equals x plus 3 in function notation, I can certainly find f of 1 by taking 1 plus 3 to get 4, f of 2 by taking 2 plus 3 to get 5, and so on and so forth. Now, when we're writing this in terms of a sequence instead of a function, we would instead write a sub n is equal to n plus 3. And again, I would get the exact same values if I plugged in 1, 1 plus 3 is still 4, and so this would be considered a sub 1, or the first term in the sequence. And this would now be considered a sub 2, the second term in the sequence. And this would be considered a sub 3, and a sub 4, and a sub 5. So again, it's just a counting mechanism using those subscripts to determine each value of the sequence. The focus of this video is actually to find the limits of a sequence, but I think it's important first to make sure we could find the next term of a sequence for any type of sequence. So let's look at a few of those questions first. So I have three sequences here for you. The first one is negative 1 to the n, n minus 2. And I've thrown this in because you're going to see this a lot where you have a negative 1 to the n because that's going to alter our sign. It's going to make our sign go back and forth between positive and negative. So for instance, a sub 1 would be plugging 1 in for n. So that would be negative 1 to the first and then 1 minus 2. So negative 1 to the first is negative 1. 1 minus 2 is negative 1, so my first result is 1 a sub 2 would be negative 1 squared, and then 2 minus 2, so this is actually positive 1, and then times 0, which is 0, and then a sub 3 is negative 1 to the third, which gives me negative 1 again, because it's an odd number of negatives, and then 3 minus 2, which is 1, so that's negative 1, a sub 4 would be negative 1 to the 4th, which of course is going to give me positive 1, and then 4 minus 2, so it's going to be 1 times 2, which is 2, and then a sub 5 is negative 1 to the 5th, which gives me negative 1 again, and then 5 minus 2 is 3, so negative 3. So we didn't really see that oscillating happen until we got here negative, positive, negative, but that's what that negative 1 to the nth power is going to do for us each time. Continuing on, b sub 1 would be 3 times 1, which is 3, over 1 plus 4, which is 5. b sub 2 is 3 times 2, which is 6, over 2 plus 4, which is 6. b sub 3 is 3 times 3, which is 9, over 3 plus 4, which is 7. b sub 4 would be 3 times 4, which is 12, and 4 plus 4, which is 8, and of course we would reduce. And b sub 5 is 3 times 5, or 15, over 5 plus 4, which is 9, and of course we would reduce. The last one is a little bit different. All of the, or both of the other examples, I've essentially given you a function. I could have written this as f of x equals negative 1 to the x, and then x minus 2. This uh, is a recursive definition, and so as I can see, they're giving me a value to begin with, and then they're saying, hey, to find each subsequent value, take the value before and add 4. So they've given me c sub 0 is 2, so if I need to find c sub 1, that is telling me to take c sub 0 plus 4, or in this case 2 plus 4, which is 6. And then c sub 2 would be c sub 1 plus 4, so that's 6 plus 4, or 10. And then c sub 3 would be 10 plus 4, or 14. 
C sub 4 would be 14 plus 4, which is 18, and C sub 5 would be 18 plus 4, or 22. So that's how we use a recursive definition, is it's using the value before. And sometimes you're going to see it written like this, and sometimes you're going to see, pardon me, C sub n plus 1 is equal to C sub n plus 4. Both are perfectly acceptable. I prefer this um, notation. Now that we understand sequences, we want to take a look at how to find the limit of a sequence. And essentially, what we're saying is, we already know that if we have some function, f of x, we can find the limit of that function by finding the value as x approaches infinity. And that is L, the limit of the function. We've dealt with this several chapters in Calculus 1. This is saying, if you have a sequence that can be written as a function, so f of n is equal to the nth term of the sequence for every positive integer n, then the limit of the function is the same as the limit of the sequence. And so what all of that means is if I'm trying to find the limit of this sequence, I can just find the limit of this function and it's the same as the limit of the sequence. And so that's good news because we already know how to find the limits of functions. So I'm going to find the limit as n approaches infinity of n minus one over n factorial. So again, you could, if you wanted to, find the first several terms of the sequence. So if I plugged in 1, I would get 1 minus 1 over 1, which would be 0. And if I plugged in 2, I would get 2 minus 1 over 2 factorial, so 2 minus 1 half or 3 halves. And I could continue finding values to see if there were a pattern. But instead, let's just use our math brains and think about this analytically. If I'm trying to sort of plug in infinity for n. What's going to happen to n? As n increases without bound, this value is going to increase without bound. And as I take 1 over n factorial, so as this value increases without bound, 1 divided by a very, very large number gets closer and closer to 0. So this is infinity minus 0, or infinity. Now, is that a limit. No, it is not. So this actually diverges. So the only time we're going to have a convergent sequence is when the limit actually exists. And we know that if we get a limit of infinity, that really means that the limit doesn't exist. So let's take a look at the second example. And the second example, again, I'm going to be thinking about the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus negative 1 to the n over n squared. And again, I could start finding the first several terms of the sequence to help me understand. If I plug in 1, I'm going to get 1 plus negative 1 to the first, which is going to be 0, so it doesn't matter what the denominator is. If I plug in 2, I'm going to get 1 plus 1, 1 plus 1 over 2 squared, so I have 2 over 4, or 1 half. And then if I plug in 3, I'm going to get 0. And if I plug in 4, I'm going to get 1 plus 1, which is 2 over 4 squared, or 16, 2 sixteenths, or 1 eight. And I know that every other term is going to be a 0. And so it kind of looks like these values are going to keep getting smaller and smaller. But again, let's use our math brain instead and think about this analytically. I want to determine the limit of this sequence. Now, if I try to do direct substitution, it's going to get a little tricky just because of this guy, and we're not really sure what to make of that. So instead, let's think about multiplying by the conjugate. Remember, the conjugate is the same values, but opposite sign. And of course, if I do it to the numerator, I have to do it to the denominator as well. So what's that going to give me? That's going to give me the limit as n approaches infinity. That was an awful arrow. n approaches infinity. The numerator is now 1 times 1, which is 1. And then I'm going to have plus uh, 
negative 1 to the n times 1, so that's plus negative 1 to the n, and then I'm going to have minus negative 1 to the n, so those two cancel out, and then I've got plus, I'm sorry, minus, please go away, minus negative 1 to the 2n. And then my denominator is n squared and then 1 minus negative 1 to the n. So why was that helpful? Why did I do all of that work? Well, let's take a look up here. If I have negative 1 to the 2n, negative 1 to the 2n, because this is even, if I take a negative value squared or to the fourth, I'm going to get a positive value. So essentially what happens is I have the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 minus, and then we talked about negative 1 to the whatever even power is always going to be 1. So n squared over 1 minus negative 1 to the n, 1 minus 1 is 0, and so it doesn't matter what the denominator is. My limit is 0 because 1 minus 1 is 0. So this has a limit of 0, which means, of course, that this converges, and that makes perfect sense because I have 1 half, and then I have 1 eighth, and my best guess is the next one's probably going to be like 1 16th or 1 32nd or 1 64th and obviously I haven't figured that out ahead of time but I can see that that value is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and approach 0 so this limit of 0 makes a perfect makes perfect sense let's take a look at a couple more for the first one again I'm thinking about the limit as n approaches infinity of the cubed root of n over the cubed root, oops, the cubed root of n plus 1. And again, the first thing I would do each time is to think about if I tried direct substitution. And if I did that, I would essentially get the cubed root of n. This guy would keep getting bigger, and this guy would keep getting bigger. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the limit doesn't exist. That just means I have to outsmart the question. So I could think about multiplying by the conjugate. We tried that on the last one and take the cubed root of n minus 1. But we're going to find that that's not going to be helpful either because it's just going to make things more complicated. It isn't going to help us to find the solution. Now, keep in mind that you're not going to know that perhaps until you actually try it. So for this one, what actually might be helpful is if I multiply the numerator and denominator by the cubed root of n. I'm sorry, 1 over the cubed root of n. That's supposed to be a 3. I know it's really hard to tell. Now, why might this be helpful? Because now I'm finding the limit as n approaches infinity. If I take the cubed root of n times 1 over the cubed root of n, I get 1. And if I take the cubed root of n times 1 over the cubed root of n, I get 1. And if I take 1 times 1 over the cubed root of n, I get 1 over the cubed root of n. Now you might be saying, hold up, because that's not helpful. Now I have a fraction and a fraction, and we all know that's a big no-no. However, I'm just trying to find the limit. So if I take a look now at this limit, the limit as n approaches infinity, actually I'm not even going to write the limit because I'm going to figure it out. This guy is 1, this guy is 1, 1 over the cubed root of n. Remember we already talked about this guy is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So this is really like 1 over infinity, <laughs> not 8, but infinity. What happens when I take 1 divided by an increasingly large number? I get 0. So my limit is 1 over 1, or just 1, which means this converges, and the limit is 1. Let's take a look at our second example. We have a sub n equals n plus 1 factorial over n factorial. So again, I'm trying to find the limit as n approaches infinity of n plus 1 factorial over n factorial. 
You might not have dealt with factorial questions for a while. Again, it's something that's going to keep coming up throughout your mathematical journey. So what I want you to remember is I can think about n plus 1 factorial as being n plus 1. And then remember factorial says that sequence is going to continue to decrease. So n plus 1 minus 1 which of course is just n, and then n minus 1, and then n minus 1 minus 1. So I'm just taking the term before and subtracting 1, which of course is n minus 2, and you get the idea that this would continue. And then if I take a look at the denominator, I have n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, and that would continue forever until we get to zero. So now keeping in mind that n minus 2 factorial can cancel n minus 1 n, what do I have left? I have the limit as n approaches infinity of n plus 1. So now if I think about direct substitution, because again, if I would have tried direct substitution here, this would just been infinity over infinity, which means find a new strategy. But now I can take a look and I have infinity plus one, so the limit is infinity, which means this diverges. And therefore no limit exists, or because no limit exists, the sequence diverges. There are obviously many more examples we could have gone through together for finding the limits of a sequence. A lot of that will go back to strategies learned in Calculus 1 in the first several chapters of our text that take us through different strategies for finding limits. I'm going to leave the rest of those to you. We're going to move on to pattern recognition for sequences.